Okay, so we now we should now be on YouTube, but I'm going to mute the YouTube channel. All right, but I will read the YouTube comments as we're going through this so I can let you know if any questions show up there. Sure. Now that there's a cat, we're surely to get like twice the number of people. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, may, I, may just, uh, I may just close my door here now and uh, thwart my cat somewhat. All right, so I'm gonna let I'm gonna let folks in now at this point. Our first attendees are through the door now. Starting to count. We're wondering at the silence. We're just waiting as, as folks come in from the waiting room uh, to the webinar here. But if you think you're here to, to um, see a, a talk uh, about the history of astronomy in Canada, then you've come to the right place. If that's not why you think you're here, um, then you may have come to the wrong place, but stay anyway. <laughs> we're just going to wait a few more moments as, as people continue to file in. And uh, Peter, just so you know, Dennis Crabtree is saying, good to see you. Oh, hello, Dennis. I didn't expect to see you here. Thanks for the cute picture of Bernie Sanders at McDonald Observatory. And uh, we've just had a, a welcome from Calgary Center from Judy Sterner. Um, I'll just remind folks, now that people are starting to use the chat box, um, that you might want to change the little blue tab at the, stop, at the top of your chat window from two panelists to say two panelists and attendees, if you'd like everyone to be able to read your chat. Of course, if you're just trying to say something to us, like get on with the talk or something, well, then you can leave it at panelists, but uh, <laughs> but, but you may want to switch that to all panelists and attendees. Thank you, Judy, for demonstrating that. Excellent. <laughs> Clark is now showing off that the communication can be two-way in the chat window. <laughs> it looks like our numbers are slowing down a bit, so we may want to start uh, so we don't have too much dead air on the YouTube channel as, as folks are watching over there. So I will just start by saying welcome everybody to this, the first uh, RASC special speakers uh, series of the new year. Um, we can still say happy new year. It's not the end of January yet. So happy new year to everyone. Uh, please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat window. As I said, if you're, if you're just starting up your chat for the first time, you'll want to switch the little tag from two panelists to two panelists and attendees. So that you can say hello to everyone when you, when you say hello. There's another button at the bottom of your um, Zoom window, which is called Q&A. And that's where we're gonna recommend you actually put any questions you have for tonight's speaker um, during the course of it, because that'll make it easier for, for Chris and I and Clark to, to monitor the questions as they come up and Randall um, and, and titrate them. And I'm also gonna take a look at the chat thread that's happening over on our YouTube channel to make sure we don't miss any questions from over there. Um, my name is uh, Phil Groff. I'm the Executive Director of, of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. I'm sure most of you know me by now, um, but if you don't, uh, I am here with our other esteemed panelists, um, including uh, Clark Muir, Chris Beckett, and Randall Rosenfeld, and I will, um, all, all of whom are from the History Committee, and I will leave it to Clark, our MC for the evening, to introduce our special guest. Um, so I think we can probably start. I think enough people have entered. So with that, I'm going to throw it over to uh, to Clark, the uh, the um, uh, chair of our history committee. Take it away, Clark. Okay, thanks, Phil. Um, 
As Phil mentioned, I am the chair of the history committee and it's uh, my pleasure to introduce Peter in a moment. Uh, Randall, who was introduced as the uh, archivist of the RASC and Chris Beckett is also here to help uh, monitor comments and stuff. And he's also a member of the history committee. Uh, Peter Broughton was president of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada from 1992 to 1994. The service and extensive writing on the history committee in astronomy led him uh, the International Astronomical Union to name a minor planet in his honor. Uh, among Peter's writings, is a, he's the author of a book called Looking Up, A History of the RASP, which I believe was published in 1994. And of course, more recently, he wrote Northern Star, J.S. Plaskett in 2018. So Peter Broughton will be talking about uh, should J.S. Plaskett be a Canadian icon? So Peter. Okay, well, thank you very much, Clark, for the introduction. And thank you to the um, uh, RASC and the History Committee for giving me this opportunity to speak about somebody who I have spent years uh, exploring his life and achievements. And of course, I, a big thank you to all of you who are here to uh, learn more about a remarkable Canadian. Um, I, uh, for those of you who are already familiar with Plaskett, uh, I hope I will be able to make some uh, <clears throat> new uh, remarks, put, shed things in a little different light, and maybe um, bring in some details that are new to everyone. I hope, I hope there will be something for everybody in the talk is what I'm trying to say. So, um, first of all, I better get sharing my screen. Um, whoa, where, oh, where, oh, there we go. And, okay, then I want to go to the slideshow and it's from the beginning. Okay. So since the title of the talk was uh, whether um, Plaskett should be considered a Canadian icon, I thought I'd better clarify, first of all, what is an icon? Uh, it's a word with uh, many uh, different meanings. Um, it can mean an object of worship or veneration. Uh, that's certainly not what I mean. I don't think we should be worshiping Plaskett. Uh, an icon can be a symbol on your computer screen where you get rid of your unwanted files, and that's not what I want either. Uh, but the definition I'm trying to use is um, to use the word for a person who's widely recognized as an outstanding representative figure. So I wonder if you think that Plaskett should be considered a Canadian icon. I doubt that anyone would dispute that he was and still is considered to be the most important Canadian astrophysicist of his era. That is to say, he set Canadian astronomy on an entirely new course by studying starlight as a means of learning about the motions, brightness, and mass of stars. In a broader sense, um, Plaskett was the one, one of the first to show that Canada was no longer a colonial backwater. That is, as a country, we could now do research in the major leagues. His accomplishments were many, and I will spend most of my allotted time describing some of them and trying to explain how he achieved what he did. But for now, I will say that when he was interviewed by Maclean's magazine late in his life, Plaskett maintained that his greatest contribution to science was, quote, the capturing of Dominion government funds for the erection of the 72-inch telescope and, of course, the building to house it. 
Here's what the telescope looked like a year or so before it went into service. And it was the RASC, the newly formed Victoria Center, who uh, got to take this spectacular tour. And here's another view showing the telescope as it is a century later. It's now called the Plaskett Telescope. It certainly has been modified, but it still maintains its original form and mounting. There aren't many pieces of scientific equipment that are still doing research after passing their centennial, but this telescope is still used every clear night. And in fact, it's my understanding that more astronomers ask to use it than can actually be accommodated. Here's an aerial view of the observatory in its lovely setting, a few miles north of Victoria, BC. The Dominion Astrophysical Observatory, or the DAO as everybody calls it affectionately, is now part of Canada's National Research Council, some of whose buildings are seen in the photograph as well. Here, Canadian astronomers and engineers are involved in the design of scientific instruments and equipment used by some of the most advanced modern telescopes. So all this is really Plaskett's legacy. Let's go back to the portrait of the man himself. The telephone on the left, the fountain pen he's using to write with, the blotter, and of course the big chunky calculator that could add, subtract, multiply, and perhaps even divide. I'd like you to notice his dates. His birth in 1865 was just before Canadian Confederation and his death year 1941, of course, was in the midst of the Second World War. This was truly a period of national awakening during which many advances were gradually made. We are accustomed to think of our nation as beginning on July the 1st, 1867, and that was that. But in fact, Canada evolved sporadically into nationhood. When Plaskett was a young man, Canada conducted foreign affairs through the colonial office in London. We had no embassies, no foreign countries had any diplomatic presence here. We had no central bank. Our literature, art and music was all largely derivative. However, during the great war 18, 1914 to 18, Canada went through a period of dramatic political and technological change. By 1919, we had a seat at the negotiating table for the Treaty of Versailles. The following year, Canada became a founding member of the League of Nations and granted women the right to vote in federal elections. On the scientific front, the forerunner of the National Research Council was formed in 1916. And I would say the opening of the DAO was part of that great awakening of Canada as a nation. Well, there are many Canadians who made their mark in the early 20th century and who are legitimately called national icons. I will single out three. They're all people whose names, at least one hopes, uh, that their names are widely recognized. Lucy Maud Montgomery, the beloved author of Anne of Green Gables and other novels, was born nine years after Plaskett and died one year after he did. I chose this particular quote beside the, her picture um, 
it's a quote from 1911 when she was just becoming well known, but it has an amusing connection to astronomy. Another Canadian icon is, oops, it's Fred Banting. Oh, how do I go backwards? Let's see. Is there some way to go back? No, there isn't. Oh, rats. Uh, sorry about that. Just a minute until I figure out how to... I can't even see the part that says... Hey, Peter, on your keyboard, if you're using a normal uh, PowerPoint presentation, just try page uh, up. Maybe I have to go escape. For an up arrow. Yeah, there we go. Sorry. Uh, here we go. Right. Then we'll go back to the current slide. Thank you. Sorry about that. So another Canadian icon, Sir Frederick Banting. Uh, he was actually young enough to be J.S. Plaskett's son, but he died the same year that Plaskett did. Of course, famous for his discovery of insulin, and we're celebrating that discovery this very year. Um, but what has just recently come to light is that he was an amateur astronomer. I certainly didn't know that, and I don't think many people did. And my final example of a Canadian icon is Tom Thompson. Um, and um, here's his, uh, one of his beautiful paintings called Northern Lights, um, painted in can on Canoe Lake in Algonquin Park in 1917 just weeks before his mysterious death at age 39. Well, I bet every one of you could identify the constellation that's shown in the painting. But 76 years elapsed before anyone thought to try to use the stars in the painting to identify the exact time and location where the painting was done. And that was Ivan Semenuk, who, along with Thompson's diary, was able to find the very spot on Canoe Lake and the uh, month, and at least the month when it was done. So those people, Lucy Maud Montgomery, Fred Banting, Tom Thompson, they're all names that uh, we expect Canadians will recognize. Of course, holding people up as icons can sometimes lead to a limited view of their personality. Another example, Sir William Osler, long beloved for his role in medical education, uh, treat the patient, not the disease, was his dictum. He's in trouble now for his attitudes towards racialized people. So we should bear that in mind if we recognize our common interest that Osler professed in 1919 in, quote, the histories and associations of astrolabes, armillary spheres, oraries, telescopes, and lenses. Well, so far as I know, old Plaskett had no personality traits which we would now regard as reprehensible. But the fact that his paternal grandfather was a planter and a slave owner in the West Indies is an uncomfortable truth. Perhaps it's safer not to have icons. But at the same time, I really believe that Canadians, perhaps new Canadians even more so, want to learn about the country's history and the important people who shaped it. Well, now that I've got that background off my chest, let's 
actually explore the life and times of John Stanley Plaskett. Here's the earliest photo we have of him, it probably taken in 1866 or seven when he was one or two years of age. We see him in a dress as was customary for children of either sex until the early years of the 20th century. He's holding an alphabet book, a prop probably handed to him by the unknown photographer. It was likely taken in Woodstock, Ontario, the nearest town to the Plaskett farm. And when we recall that the first known photographic portrait dates from 1839, we realize that the technology was still fairly new and something that required special training. A fascinating aspect in the history of science is that developments occur in ways that seem haphazard. Some developments lead to later improvements like photography, others are dead ends. The next bit of concrete evidence in Plaskett's early life is a good example. It is what you might call a diagnosis of Plaskett's mental traits based on the measurement of bumps and the shape of his skull. The supposed science behind this sort of diagnosis is called phrenology. It was tremendously popular earlier in the 19th century though increasingly discredited by Plaskett's time. This example consists of a uh, page, a couple of pages, um, and was only recently brought to light at the DAO in Victoria. And I'm very grateful to the director emeritus, Dennis Crabtree, for sharing it with me. Plaskett apparently valued this document for he typed out the version shown here from an original that was apparent, that apparently had been in the family's hands since August of 1872. The original handwritten copy was prepared by a phrenologist by the name of Galbraith. The J.S. Plaskett that you see written at the top here uh, plus some other writing that you can't see, is actually Plaskett's own adult writing. On the left are the characteristics that Galbraith thought he could discern by studying the shape of the boy's brain or head. And on the right are pictures or maps showing where in the brain these features supposedly resided. We don't know that Galbraith used this particular chart. It's just one that I copied from the web. But many of the features in the list match those on Plaskett's chart. Let me read a part of Galbraith's report that he wrote for the six-year-old Plaskett. And here, this is all a quote. The frontal portion of his brain, the seat of intellect, is beautifully developed. He has great facility in acquiring knowledge and will show skill and judgment in applying it to the practical purposes of life. He seldom stops halfway. There is not a particle of the slow coach principle in his nature. He goes the whole figure in all his undertakings he is sure to become a man of action and energy. Considering his years, his perceptive organs are remarkably large. He can acquire knowledge from observation with an uncommon degree of facility. And a better judge of the form, size, weight, color, and indeed of all qualities of objects, it would be difficult to find. He can become a skillful draftsman 
and an elegant penman. Indeed, he is a natural mechanic. And as an engineer or machinist, he would have few equals. Well, that's the end of the quote. There was a lot more in the report. I didn't want to read the whole thing. But this last sentence seems especially prophetic. Since Plaskett did indeed initially make his mark as what we would now call a technician. Well, in my opinion, Galbraith, the phrenologist, could have discerned much of what he noted by watching, playing with, and talking to his young subject rather than by examining the shape of his head. But apparently there were plenty of people willing to pay good money to have a self-taught expert tell them about their personalities, sentiments, and intellects by examining the bumps on their heads or in the expanded realm of physiognomists, what their body structure revealed. Since most of what Galbraith wrote meshes quite well with the man that Plaskett became, I can't help but wonder, did Plaskett consciously try to live up to this prognostication prepared when he was six? He certainly valued it enough to type it out and keep it for his whole life. Much of what we know about Plaskett's early life while it, uh, came from his brother, Tom, who wrote a family history. We know from Tom that John Stanley Plaskett was the eldest of 10 children who grew up on the family farm a few miles north of Woodstock, Ontario. The home is shown here in a photo I fortunately took over 30 years ago before the house burned to the ground. The school is similar to the one that the Plaskett children would have attended. Tom also tells us about his oldest brother's innate curiosity and talent for tinkering. The boy's own annual was a Christmas gift from their aunt and uncle and <coughs> pardon me, and likely provided some inspiration and guidance for John. Building an electrostatic machine was just one of his early accomplishments. The one shown in the picture, of course, isn't the one that Plaskett built, but the fact that it's at the center of an early meeting of our society is an indication of the general fascination with the early electrical science before electric motors and electric lighting came into general use. As Galbraith, the phrenologist predicted, Plaskett used his inquisitive mind and did well in school. But on his 16th birthday, his father died. So, as the eldest child, he had to quit school to manage the family farm. We have to pause for a moment to imagine the situation. His mother was now the owner of a large working farm. Farmers would call it a quarter section or a quarter square mile. With 10 children ranging in age from 16 to two to look after. She surely deserves to be called a hero and our young man, her strongest ally. Though he didn't enjoy farm work, Plaskett did his duty as man of the house for three years. But as his younger brothers matured and accepted more responsibility, he was able to leave agriculture behind and begin work as an apprentice at Whitelaw's Foundry and Machine Shop in Woodstock. At White Laws, he would have got on-the-job training in a variety of technical skills, including the nascent technology of electricity. This background probably helped him move on to a further two-year stint with the Edison Company, first in Schenectady, New York, and then in Sherbrooke, Quebec. 
In 1889, when he was 24, a lucky coincidence brought him into contact with W.J. Loudon, who taught physics at the University of Toronto. Loudon's uncle, James, was the head of the physics department, and he later became the president of the university. Lab work had recently been introduced as a compulsory part of the mathematics and physics course, and someone was needed to maintain the equipment, set up experiments, and assist in lab work. With his practical experience, Plaskett was just the ticket, and he began work as a so-called mechanician the following year. So we come to the second phase of Plaskett's life. He served the university exceedingly well. Beyond his duties in the physics lab, he put on an electrical display at a social event in 1890. It was actually the one uh, during which the university college a large portion of it was burned. He developed the first electrical system for University College. He took pictures of campus buildings for use in the university calendars. He experimented with color photography and produced color slides for art lectures given by one of the language professors. In the physics department, he helped Professor C.A. Chant with an early demonstration of wireless transmission and assisted Professor J.C. McLennan in an experiment at Niagara Falls to determine the effect of water spray on ionization in the air. He wrote articles and gave talks. In the midst of all this, he married Reba Hemley and together they raised their first son, Harry, in their house a few blocks north of the university on Boswell Avenue. In later years, Harry would also become a renowned astronomer. At Reba's urging, Plaskett completed his high school work and then went on to earn his BA, which he achieved with high standing in 1899. In this slide, we see the well-equipped physics lab that Plaskett would have set up. We see an actual ammeter that he calibrated in 1893. And we see a photo of him studying at one of the very tables that's pictured in the lab. The University of Toronto is better than most in preserving its heritage. One can still consult textbooks that were used in the 1890s. Here we see the frontispiece to one of the physics texts that Plaskett would have used, emphasizing the importance of the study of spectra in physics. At the top, it shows the continuous spectrum, characteristic of a glowing solid heated to high temperature. And then there are, I guess, one, two, three, four, five, six uh, spectra below that. Uh, line spectra showing the bright lines emitted by various elements, sodium, uh, I don't know, can't read it all, lithium, cesium, so on. Uh, and then uh, there are some absorption spectra. Uh, this, these are formed when light from a continuous source like the photosphere of the sun or a star passes through a cooler gas, for example, the outer atmosphere of the sun or star. So the spectrum then shows these dark lines that correspond to the elements in the cooler gas. In fact, uh, spectra of the sun and some stars are shown at the bottom of this picture. The sun is forth from the bottom and then uh, three other stars uh, below that. Um, so from a star's spectrum, it, all sorts of information can be deduced about its temperature, its speed, and sometimes its mass and age. Though Plaskett did not yet realize it, we can see that topics like this were essential to his future. 
What the slide does not show, but was covered in the text, is that the lines in the spectrum shift if the star is approaching or receding from us. Plaskett would have understood that the shift was very tiny. Even for a speed of 100 kilometers a second, the shift is very small. But it's measurable if the spectrum is photographed and then viewed through a microscope. So it was possible using what's known as the Doppler shift to find the velocity in the line of sight or the radial velocity of the star being studied. Of course, at this point in his career, it was all just theory for Plaskett. What he was learning in his physics courses would eventually inform just about all his research once he became an astronomer. It's a reminder too that Courses in astronomy were not offered at the university during Plaskett's time. It may seem amazing, but in spite of the fact that we now consider him Canada's preeminent astrophysicist, Plaskett never took a course in astronomy. In 1899, the year that he earned his Bachelor of Arts degree, Plaskett joined the Toronto Camera Club. He shared an interest in what might be called art photography along with the other members, but he also saw it as a science and experimented with different technical aspects. Especially important was his experimentation with color photography. This still life image of his was the first color photograph to be published in Canada, producing a color image that accurately that accurately represented what our eyes can see required a great deal of research involving different photographic emulsions, different filters, various exposures, but Plaskett was up to the task and proved himself to be a thorough and methodical researcher. Though Plaskett's colleagues at the university thought he would be an asset on the teaching faculty, the gruff and autocratic McLennan, who was now the head of the physics department, did not. So when a chance came for Plaskett to apply for a position elsewhere, namely at the Dominion Observatory in Ottawa, he jumped at it. So we're now on to the third phase of Plaskett's life in Ottawa. The observatory was the initiative of W.F. King, Canada's chief astronomer. It the observatory was not yet built when Plaskett joined the staff in 1903. So he was able to document its construction and supervise the installation of equipment. King, the chief astronomer for Canada, had the foresight to realize that the study of astronomical spectra was a burgeoning field of investigation, though he himself didn't get involved in it. So before long, he let Plaskett use his photographic know-how to test various emulsions and filters and to use his mechanical talents to modify, design, and even build spectrographs. However, the staff had barely moved into the new observatory when plans for a solar eclipse expedition to Labrador in August 1905 took up most of their time. King charged Plaskett with all his scientific arrangements for the expedition. But ever the photographer, Plaskett took many pictures on the trip from Quebec. This one shows the little steamship they traveled on at a port of call. Plaskett's photos, along with others, were put into albums for the participants. W.F. King's album is now in the RASC archives, and you can all view all of the wonderful photographs online. This is one of, uh, uh, of the photos at the actual eclipse site in Labrador, and you can see uh, Plaskett and King testing the equipment. They're the ones facing the camera. Uh, tons of equipment, literally tons, had to be crated and shipped from Ottawa to Labrador. 
And uh, wouldn't you know it, the day of the eclipse was cloudy, but not all was lost. The coelostat that directed the light from the sun to the equipment shown in this picture was subsequently used for many decades in Ottawa to uh, direct a solar image to a spectrograph in the observatory's basement. You can just see the uh, main building on the left side of the picture at the top left. Uh, and the light from the sun went into the basement. And then on the right-hand side of that same picture, you can glimpse the part of the coelostat that directed the sun's rays, reflected them along that long passage to the spectrograph in the basement. Uh, Plaskett used the equipment to study the rotation rate of the sun, uh, which was a project of the International Solar Union. Though solar physics was a major part of Plaskett's research in Ottawa, it was his work with stellar spectra that led to his most important results. Here he is standing beside the spectrograph that he used to photograph the spectra of stars. It is attached to the main instrument at the Dominion Observatory, the 15 inch or 38 centimeter refractor. The stars that interested him most were spectroscopic binaries. Though such objects only appeared to be single points of light, their spectra revealed that two stars were actually present. Exposures of as much as an hour to capture the spectrum of a fifth magnitude star was needed and you can imagine Plaskett standing in the cold guiding the telescope to make sure it continued to point at the star. Quite different from the way professional astronomers operate today. But the, the real importance in the spectroscopic binaries was that they gave information about the mass of the stars. Now I wasn't sure about sticking this slide in, but for what it's worth, it gives a very basic idea using only high school physics of how mass can be inferred from pairs of stars revolving in a circular orbit around their center of gravity. Uh, the velocity can be found by measuring the tiny Doppler shift in the position of the lines in the spectrum. And the period can be found by examining many spectra of the same star to see how many days it took before the pattern of shifts began to repeat. The bottom line is that mass can be found from velocity and period. There are many complications, so I won't spend time on this now, but if you have questions, we could return to this maybe at the end. I mentioned earlier that Plaskett participated in the measuring the rotation of the sun, which was a project of the International Solar Union. And a meeting of that organization in 1910 held in California at Mount Wilson was very significant for Plaskett. There he was able to meet some of the world's most famous astronomers and ask their advice. Remember, he was virtually on his own in Ottawa. There were no people in Canada who had experience with photographing the spectra of stars. Professor Chant at the University of Toronto was an important figure in promoting, popular, in promoting and popularizing astronomy and in educating future astronomers, but uh, he had very little practical experience. I've highlighted a couple of astronomers who were especially influential uh, there's Frank Schlesinger of Pittsburgh, J.C. Captain from Holland. Um, the only woman in this part of the photo was Williamina Fleming from the Harvard Observatory, uh, who did a great deal of important research, but unfortunately died less than a year after this picture was taken. 
um, at this meeting in 1910, Plaskett also saw a large 1.5 meter reflector telescope at Mount Wilson. It was being used to study spectra of stars. It was the largest telescope in the world at the time. And Plaskett began to realize that if Canada was to be able to do research on a par with Mount Wilson, then Canada would have to get a telescope at least as big. But as he would find out, the way this telescope was mounted was not ideal. The upper end of the telescope could sag by varying amounts depending on the way it was pointed. From 1910 on, Plaskett was determined to convince his boss, W.F. King, and the Canadian government to finance a new large reflector. One cannot fail to be full of admiration for the way he mobilized other astronomers and societies to advocate on behalf of the project. Even his old Toronto nemesis, J.C. McLennan, came to the fore, and McLennan deserves credit for encouraging King and Plaskett to look for better places than Ottawa as a site for a new large observatory. Plaskett personally spoke to members of parliament who showed interest and pushed the project among members of Prime Minister Borden's cabinet. Finally, approval came in 1913. When we realized that the four years leading up to the completion of the telescope were the years of the Great War, 1914 to 18, it seems astounding that the government allowed the project to proceed to completion. So now we reach the fourth and final phase of Plaskett's life, his time in Victoria. It was Plaskett's idea to use a different type of mounting from the fork type that he had seen on Mount Wilson. And he opted to use a type called the cross axis mounting that had been used successfully though on a smaller scale at the University of Michigan. Eventually in the years and decades ahead, the design of Plaskett's telescope was emulated around the world. Uh, the oldest one in this series of pictures is the Perkins Observatory in Ohio. And during the manufacture of its mirror, that observatory employed Plaskett as an independent consultant. Um, also, uh, during Plaskett's time in Victoria, he worked to improve spectrographs and really it was a continuation of the work he had started in Ottawa. And so he became widely recognized for instrumental design of telescopes and spectroscopes. In fact, one of his last major projects was an, as an optical consultant for the McDonald Telescope in Texas in 1939 a larger and very different instrument from the one at the DAO. So now let's consider what astronomy uh, Plaskett did with his magnificent new telescope in Victoria. I haven't time to go into great detail, so I will mention only two aspects of his work the first that attracted great attention, especially among the public and the media, was the discovery of a pair of stars that were more massive than any others and which retained that record for many decades. The pair of stars is so far away that even through a telescope as powerful as the one at the DAO, the pair appears as a single star. But when, when its spectrum was studied, the lines in the spectrum were double, implying the star's binary nature and allowing the orbit of the components around each other to be calculated and the information about the mass to be calculated. The fact that these pair of stars was more massive than any others was important for theorists in that it allowed them to extend the range 
uh, of the mass, so-called mass luminosity relationship. Um, this illustration is from a popular magazine of the time called Public Opinion, the sort of Reader's Digest of the 1920s. This is but one example of the tremendous press coverage of his discovery, not only in Canada, but around the world. It is also an indication of Plaskett's relentless efforts to promote the wonderful work that he, the observatory and Canada were doing. A close up uh, here um, shows the dimensions that could be inferred from the uh, meticulous study of the spectrum as it changed over the course of the months in 1921 and 22. Um, Unfortunately, there should be an extra million in the distance given here. Uh, you know, he, I guess Plaskett converted it to miles to make it easy for the readers of current opinion, but he should have said million, million instead of what he said. Anyway, another thing to notice is the swirling in the diagram it hints at the important realization that gas streaming from one star to another greatly complicates the study of the spectrum. Before I say anything else about Plaskett's research, I'll take a little detour to talk about the importance of scientific meetings. Even today, of course, it's really important for those involved in research to meet face to face, though perhaps only virtually, to learn about recent advances. Such uh, encounters were absolutely vital to Plaskett since he had almost no one else in Canada with whom he could discuss problems he was facing or how they might be resolved. So he traveled almost every year to the States and during his career made five trips to Europe for meetings of the International Astronomical Union. Here are a couple of illustrations relating to the 1928 IAU meeting at Leiden in Holland. He actually made the trip on crutches and you can just glimpse past Plaskett at the extreme left edge of the photograph uh, taking pictures of the group and supported by a crutch under his arm. This is the actual ship and date of his transatlantic crossing. And I've included also a CPR photo as a reminder that an overseas trip like this meant close to three weeks of travel time. First across the country by train and then by liner down the St. Lawrence and across the ocean. The cost of such a trip was about a quarter of Plaskett's annual salary, and he had to pester and cajole government to provide expenses. Sometimes he even appealed to the prime minister. The 1928 meeting was especially important because Leiden was the home of astronomer Jan Ort, who had been studying the rotation of the Milky Way. In fact, Ort was a student of Jacobus Kaptein, whom I pointed out in the 1910 slide of astronomers at Mount Wilson. Plaskett had sent Kaptein some of his measurements of stellar spectra, which Ort then made good use of. Discerning that the Milky Way is rotating and measuring how rapidly it is doing so is a very complicated problem much more so than measuring the rotation of external galaxies. It is literally hard to see the forest for the trees. Earth's daily rotation and its yearly revolution around the sun have to be subtracted out from all radial velocities. Then the sun has its own motion relative to those in its neighborhood. Then there are clusters of stars that move together and after all these factors are taken into account, it is only the difference 
between our velocity around the center and the other star's velocity that can be found. The difference naturally increases with distance, but at great distances, only the most luminous stars were bright enough for Plaskett to capture their spectra. And those were the O and B stars, which had always been Plaskett's specialty since his early days in Ottawa. Building on Ort's work, Plaskett and his Canadian colleague, Joseph Pierce, whom he hired in 1924, showed conclusively that this giant star system of stars, our Milky Way, that we can only see from inside, is rotating around about a distant center in the direction of Sagittarius. Some would see this insight as significant as the Copernican revolution just as it had been shown in the 16th century that we on the earth revolve in a yearly orbit round the sun, now it was established that the sun is revolving in a giant orbit around the center of the galaxy. In fact, Plaskett's 1935 model of what the Milky Way would look like from the outside, if we could travel at the speed of light for 100,000 years and look back, the model is pretty much the same basic model that astronomers still use. How remarkable that this derived from measurements on Earth and on the observations and calculations of astronomers like Plaskett and Pierce. How remarkable that it looks similar to systems of stars that we can see as we look out into space. You'll see by the scale at the bottom that he placed the sun 10,000 parsecs or 32,600 light years from the galaxy's center. Now, if you've read your current issue of the RASC journal, you'll see that the best up-to-date values for the distance to the galactic center is 25,800 light years. And the velocity around the center 227 kilometers per second. Nearly 90 years ago, the value that Plaskett found for both were only 25% higher. Interesting, since he overestimated both the speed and the size, the time required for one orbit of the sun around the galactic center was the currently accepted value of 200 million years. And using the formula I showed earlier, that r cubed over p squared is equal to the mass, the mass of the galaxy, as Plaskett found, works out to 200 billion solar masses. It's very easy to try it out for yourself. Just remember to convert r into astronomical units. 200 billion is, of course, just the mass within the solar distance to the center. The observer's handbook tells us that the mass of the Milky Way is a trillion suns, or five times what Plaskett found. However, the trillion figure includes the huge galactic halo, three quarters of which is supposedly invisible dark matter. So Plaskett was really quite accurate if we're talking about baryonic matter or the stuff we can see. As we all know, one of our nearest neighboring galaxies, the one in Andromeda, is very much like our Milky Way. Peter? Yes? We have a question. If, can you just go back to the previous slide? Do you mind answering a question? Uh, well, it's a little awkward to go back could uh, remind me, I'm almost at the end, so I'll- Okay, we'll come back to it. Uh -huh. um, the Andromeda galaxy, of course, is very much like our own, and we're so used to saying that, it's easy to forget that just a decade before Plaskett and Pierce carried out their Milky Way research, most astronomers still thought that the Milky Way was the entire universe 
and that the nebula in Andromeda, as it was called, it was just a cloudy feature embedded in it. So progress was rapid, even in the 1930s. Well, for all his wonderful work, Plask had earned a great deal of recognition, recognition in the highest order. And in this slide here, you see he had five honorary degrees. The first came from Pittsburgh, thanks to his friend John Brashear, who built the, teles built the optics for the Victoria Telescope, and also the one in Ottawa, for that matter. Uh, he was recognized in Canada, uh, the culmination being the commander of the British Empire. We, of course, didn't have any Order of Canada in those days. Um, he had uh, uh, four um, awards from prestigious organizations in the United States. And in the United Kingdom, he was a fellow of the Royal Society. He was a gold medalist of the RAS, and he delivered the Halley Lecture to the University of Oxford in 1935. Uh, and that the uh, recognition didn't stop after his death. Um, the uh, a large crater near the North Pole of the Moon. Uh, it's called Plaskett Crater, and there are outlying uh, subcraters and other features. Um, nice picture of the crater here. And Don Morton, a Canadian astronomer now retired, an avid mountain climber, named this peak in the Rockies after Plaskett. And in Esquimalta suburb of Victoria is the house, well, the house is no longer there, it's demolished, but um, when Plaskett lived there, it was called 318 Armit Street, and subsequently it was named Plaskett Place. Um, the Plaskett always had a very strong connection to the Anglican Church. Faith was a very important part of his life. He was on the building committee for the cathedral, uh, Christ Church Cathedral in Victoria, though he attended a, a parish church. And um, there is now a memorial window to Plaskett uh, in the church. At the bottom, you probably can't read it, I don't know, but it says, to the glory of God and in loving memory of Dr. J.S. Plaskett, and gives his dates. And you might be interested to know that the family paid for the window by melting down Plaskett's gold medals that he had been awarded. Um, well, we're nearly at the end, and I just want to think a little bit about how Plaskett achieved what he did especially considering that he never took an astronomy course in his life. Um, his technical expertise certainly stood him in good stead. But beyond that, our qualities of his personality, which I think are still relevant today, and I summarize them here and you can take a moment to read them. So I will conclude now with the, the way I began by asking, do you think that Plaskett should be considered a Canadian icon? Maybe you have ideas uh, why we educated Canadians are expected to know about the group of seven and Stephen Leacock and Emily Carr, um, Lucy Maud Montgomery, but very few Canadians know anything about John Stanley Plaskett. 
So I'd be very interested to hear your thoughts and your questions. And I will conclude with that. Okay, so. okay, so there was a question uh, at one point, and I... Yeah, P Peter Jedeke has a question, so I'm going to ask Phil to unmute Peter Jedeke. Uh, Hello, hopefully. Peter. Although I don't see Phil anymore. Clark, do you have the power to unmute Peter? Um, I'm not, am I muted? No, Peter uh, Jedeke. We're going to see if we can unmute Peter Jedeke. Well, I'm here if you guys can hear me. Yeah, hey, we can hear you now, Peter. Go ahead. Okay. Hi, Peter Broughton. I loved your talk. Thank you very much for doing this. No. Um, I think I've actually asked you this question in the past. You, the diagram that you showed, the, the side view of the Milky Way galaxy that uh, Plaskett published in JRASC back in 1935, Yes. Uh, and I just wonder if maybe you have an update for me since the last time I asked you. I, I can't find an earlier example in any uh, in any publication, in any research journal anywhere of that same side view of the diagram. And I'm just suspecting that that's the first time the diagram side, the side view of the galaxy was ever published that way. Any thoughts on that? Thank you. Well, uh, you can go back to William Herschel. Uh, he he published a diagram of what he thought the, the galaxy looked like from outside. Uh, or, well, I guess it was really a view of the entire universe in Herschel's day, but it was a, a layer of stars. I don't know whether that, would, whether that would fit in with what you're thinking about. It obviously was very different from <laughs> what Plaskett illustrated. Um, right, I agree that it was it was very different, and of course, um, you know that wasn't a side view. What Herschel Herschel's famous exploded tea that tea, tea bag diagram wasn't uh, wasn't a side view, and of course, it didn't include features like the line down the middle that represents the dark lane and the you know in the zero uh, in the zero z axis that yeah, we well, know of in the galaxy. And I'm just again, I'm just wondering if Plaskett was the first person. You know, who kind of thought of the idea of, of how useful it would be to draw it as a side view. Yeah, well, I think you're right. Uh, I don't remember you asking me that question in previous years, so it's a good one to look into. Um, uh, it certainly was a very influential diagram. Um, I think it was uh, Harlow Shapley who had a source book in astronomy uh, compiled uh, of uh, what's the word I'm looking for very influential papers in astronomy and um, included that one and the diagram as you know a, a cornerstone of uh, 20th century astronomy and um, I've heard Virginia Trimble say that it, it's it, you know, it's the model we still use that, uh, well, she said that a few years ago, but <laughs> um, it certainly was influential and maybe was the first, I'm not sure. There's something for you to investigate. Well, I think it was particularly impressive that he put the position of the sun in what looks like a very accurate spot as well. Yes, of course, um, Ort had a similar idea about the galaxy, but he had less data to work with. And some of Ort's data was Plaskett's too. Uh, and I can't remember right now uh, the distance that Ort figured uh, the sun was from the center, but it, it wasn't as good an estimate as Plaskett and Pierce came up with, that's for sure. Okay, hi, Peter, Dennis here. Um, yeah, about his Plaskett's and Pierce's work, uh, you know, Virginia Trimble is one that I think sometime in the 90s had, you know, Plaskett, that diagram you showed of Plaskett's is still basically the one they showed at 
students today is what the galaxy looks like. Mm -hmm. And also in the history of the H H Palomar Observatory, I believe, or the Hale Observatories, uh, Ellen um, Sandridge is quoted as saying something like, the work that work is some of the finest work that's ever been published. So, yeah. uh, so it's, uh, it's really recognized as uh, an amazing contribution. Yeah. As, as regard to his status as a icon, I found a while back, I just refound it in Hansard in 1944, and they're discussing a long thing about um, foreigners in Canada and things in the war. Anyways, there was a writer's war committee, and they ended up producing some short biographies of prominent Canadians for foreign language press uh, to raise their the Canadian consciousness of them. And this included people such as Sir Frederick Pantene, John A. Macdonald, Wilford Laurier, and J.S. Plaskett. So that's pretty good company. Indeed. Uh, I'm not sure how influential those publications were, but I wish they, I hope and wish they were. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, you know, that he was selected as one of the uh, prominent Canadians uh, to, uh, was, uh, I thought was pretty good. But of course, yeah. yeah. Anyways, there's some interest. Yeah, I fully agree with you, Dennis, that he is one of the outstanding Canadians. But um, and it's great that somebody at one point recognized this after his death. But well, we know that astronomers certainly do, but the general public, it just amazes me that uh, you know, very well educated people who seem to know a lot about Canadian history, they don't know a thing about. Plaskett. But mind you, I've also read somewhere that even after Frederick Banding's wonderful biography was written by Michael Bliss, an outstanding Canadian historian, somebody did a survey asking generally if Canadians, you know, have you heard of Frederick Banding? And only 11% had. So it's an uphill battle. <laughs> it is. It is. Um... And also about uh, the Plaskett family connection to uh, St. Croix, the Danish West Indies. Um, if you go back to the Danish uh, census records of, of you know, 1841, 1845, uh, there's, you know, there's many, many Plaskets listed, you know. Um, so, you know, they were both uh, relatives, relatives of, of the Plaskets, but also uh, slaves that took on their names and whatever. So uh, I think what my understanding is any Plaskett that comes from the Danish West Indies, which is now the U.S. Virgin Islands, is basically connected, you know, takes that name from, the, from that Plaskett family. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, um, the... Uh, it's unfortunate that some some of us have black sheep in our ancestry, but we all have black sheep if you look hard enough. I have yeah. a cousin. I have a cousin that was killed in a shootout with police west of Chicago. <laughs> uh, I see Nicholas David's name. Yes, can you hear me? Uh, I don't think we've met before, but nice to meet you virtually. At least I see your name. Yeah, we heard you. Yes. Um, thank you very much, Peter, for the talk. We did meet, actually, in, uh, at the uh, GA in, in Calgary. Oh, good. Um, uh, referring, going back to Plaskett's diagram, uh, I think it differs quite a lot from Herschel's in that it includes the halo of globular clusters, or I think it, they must be the globular clusters. Um, but I, my more important question was, it, it seems from your book that uh, GSP's contribution to the building of the much bigger refractors in the US was, was really very significant and that he was a, a, a very important world figure in that way in astronomy. Well, he certainly played a major role in uh, the Perkins Observatory that I mentioned and uh, McDonald Observatory in Texas. Uh, I'd, I'm not aware of 
other American observatories that he uh, actively uh, was involved with uh, in the development stage, but uh, as the, the others, the slide I showed of uh, similar telescopes around the world, um, they certainly emulated the design, but Plaskett, as far as I know, was not involved in uh, advising them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I was just going to, uh, to say that uh, we have a comment from YouTube um, from, a, from a viewer there from Kansas who says, uh, well, first of all, it said that you know, he agrees with you that with all his contributions, we should definitely know about Plaskett. Um, also saying that uh, uh, from his research thus far, now mostly it's just uh, some Google search and such, he, it appears that Plaskett's diagram uh, was the first to picture the, the, the galaxy from the side like that, but, but he's hoping, hoping to do more research than, uh, than he's been able to, to do on that so far. Uh huh. So, but just wanted to know the folks on YouTube are are, are paying attention as well. That's yeah, nice. So, thanks for googling. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions from folks? We have time for someone. I, speaking of googling, someone that I just mentioned in passing, Williamina Fleming, who was in that picture from 1910. She's certainly somebody you should, uh, if you don't know much about her, uh, have a look. Uh, some of her amazing accomplishments. Yeah, she discovered the Horsehead Nebula, so all the visual observers out there know her for that. Yes, that's right. Plus, I think dozens or maybe oh, hundreds yeah. of other nebulae she discovered. So, uh, Exactly. Mm -hmm. Um, if I could offer a comment, it's just a quick comment about um, the telescopes and models. Mm -hmm. um, of course, you know, if you build a successful telescope in your professional institution, you will have people taking the uh, best uh, you know, you know, features of that and improving on them. Most of those instruments Peter showed are actually Grubb instruments, uh, Grubb Parsons, and their immediate source is a DDO 74-inch. But Rich Gerrell, in a paper he published, um, God, I don't remember when, sometime in the 90s, early 2000s, said that the Plaska telescope, so, so the 72-inch in Victoria, was actually the most important influence on that 74-inch in, in, in the DDO. So it's sort of like a, it's the grandfather of those, if you like. Yes. And the other thing I should say Just is... Before about, you... I, yeah. I'm just going to comment a little bit further on that and point out, of course, that Reynold Young, who was Plaskett's first assistant at, in Victoria, uh, moved to, to Toronto uh, in the 1920s and uh, built a 19-inch telescope for the DDO, the David Dunlap Observatory. And that was an important uh, step also in um, the design of the 74 inch. Uh, so that's sort of another link between Victoria and Toronto. Sorry to interrupt you, Randall. Oh, hell no, no I'm, I'm not sure who's interrupting who. So I'm gonna interrupt you now. Um, speaking of the... The 72 inch actually had an influence on amateur telescope makers, part of that movement, um, Porter and, and Ingalls. At least one of them who wrote in and got his article and his article published in Scientific American said that he copied the mounting. This is for a six or an eight inch, but he specifically copied the mounting of the 72 inch Victoria, which is sort of cool. Yeah, right. And, and, it, and it may even have ended up in one of those uh, amateur telescope making books, sort of the Bible for people who did this sort of thing. I've forgotten now, but there was some, uh, I'll see if Ingalls is in the uh, index. Yeah, there was something else that Ingalls did, uh, which I mentioned in the book, but I've forgotten now. Uh, it's so long ago. <laughs> um, hey, 
Hey, Vic's online. Cool. Uh, Vic is actually uh, a, a fantastic, he's retired now. He's a fantastic solar astronomer. Good heavens. Yeah. Vic Oscars? Yeah. Uh, oh, can nice. you put him, can you put him on, can you um, unmute him? Yeah, I think cool. Phil has to do the honors. Yeah. He was a director of the oh, Ottawa Valley Solar. Oh, hello, Vic. Can you hear me? I think he'll need to unmute you, himself. There you go. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Oh, yes. All right, That's, fine. No, I just wanted to go back to solar topics a bit. Good. Because you did bring up the, uh, the 1910 meeting of the uh, uh, International Solar Union in Pasadena. That was a very important occasion for solar physics in Canada because it was there that Plaskett decided that they should undertake the uh, uh, analysis of the differential rotation of the sun, not just the rotation of the sun, but it's a differential rotation. That is, you would go to different latitudes of the sun and set a uh, spectrograph slit tangentially to the limb at that latitude, uh, first on the eastern limb with the sun approaching you, and then over to the western limb at the same latitude with the sun receding from you. And from that, you determine the rate of rotation of the sun at different latitudes. And the, the work was actually carried out by Ralph Delury, who was a graduate in chemistry from the University of Toronto. He had his, his doctorate in chemistry. And I don't think it could have been he who designed the spectrograph for this. It was most likely Plaskett. This is an unusual spectrograph because it was a grading instrument but it, it rotated around its central axis so that you could set the slit of the limb tangential to the sun no matter. And of course the sun, its polar axis appears at different angles to the, in, the, in the sky uh, as we proceed around our orbit. Uh, so there is a lot of adjusting to do to get the slit to be truly tangential to a given latitude on the sun. It, it just required a lot of mechanical ingenuity. And I think it must have been Plaskett who designed that uh, uh, spectrograph, although um, Delury went on to use it for many decades. And uh, his final analysis of the whole thing was considered su sufficiently worthy of being included in the 1970 summary by uh, Bob Howard and Jack Harvey of the, uh, uh, what is now considered the standard formulae, it's a polynomial formula, uh, depend, it, which relates the, the latitude you're at to the rate of rotation of the sun. This is a very important factor that you have to know uh, when you're looking at any structure on the sun. And I think that's, that's largely due to Plaskett as well. Well, I'm very grateful to hear your input, Vic, uh, for those who don't recognize his name, Vic Kazoskas is the Dean of Solar Astronomers in Canada. And um, he struggled with a lot of the equipment that uh, originated with Plaskett. And uh, of course had much better equipment later on, but um, it's wonderful to get your input. Uh, I might just add one comment that at first uh, reading about what you were just referring to, the differential rate of rotation of the sun, I thought, well, why didn't they just use sunspots? And then uh, on further um, reading, I realized that sunspots never, I guess you could correct me, Vic, but I'll say never, uh, appear on the sun above latitude, what say 50 degrees, um, and only rarely at high latitudes anyway. So uh, it was impossible to get the rotation rate of the sun at high latitudes. But sunspots also have a proper rotation of their own. 
So you oh. really have to use an awful lot of sunspots to come up with an average figure. Uh, I see. You mean that the sun the sunspots don't rotate around the sun around the sun at the same rate as the atmosphere of the sun? That's not correct. They, the uh, the typical thing that happens when a new sunspot group emerges is that the spots spread apart. The leading uh, sunspot tends to have a higher velocity and moves further towards the direct in the direction of rotation. Even at the same latitude. Even at the same latitude. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. I didn't know yeah. that. Yeah. Uh huh. Oh well. But then there were also some kind of things that seem very strange now, and that was the one of the investigations of the solar union was to see if different spectral lines showed different rotation rates. Yeah, this engaged uh, Louise Hertzberg, who was uh, uh, Gerhard Hertzberg's first wife. She was at the observatory when I first arrived in 1955. And this is the kind of problem she was investigating, uh, looking at um, the, uh, the limb of the sun uh, in different spectral lines, because there seemed to be a lot of confusion in getting precise rates of rotation. Now, what they didn't realize, it took another decade. Well, in fact, in, in the 1950s, it was only in the 1950s that solar astronomers were willing to accept the actual fact of granulation. Up until 1950, roughly, everybody thought, or not everybody, I shouldn't say that, but a good many people thought that this is a purely instrumental effect. Mm. It was quite a controversy over whether or not granulation was real. And it was only until you got really powerful, large solar telescopes or the stratoscope, for example, launched by Princeton in the late 1950s, that the reality uh, became clear. And once the study shifted to very high spatial resolution on the sun, it came to be realized that the granules themselves were the seats of motion. You had strong convective motions or the rising gases rising in the center of the bright, the bright material at the center of a granule is rising at a rate of somewhat in excess of a kilometer per second. And the dark lanes is where matter is falling back in again. So now think what happens when you go from the center of the sun to the limb of the sun, as the perspective gets worse and worse around the edge, you begin to lose the bright granules faster than you do the dark ones. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this huh. messes up the very, if you try to get very accurate Doppler measurements at the limit of the sun, it gets messed up because of what the granules are doing. Yeah. It, in other words, you cannot put a really absolute figure like the standard for a, uh, a, a length or an atomic length determined in an interferometer. You just cannot do that mm -hmm. in the case of the sun because the surface of itself, itself is not uniform, even on a very fine scale. Fascinating. And no one is better qualified to talk about it than yourself. Well, that's, so, that's, you. that's most certainly not true. But <laughs> well, amongst this audience, anyway. <laughs> um, Peter, you, I know you've done significant research in, in the war effort by astronomers and some of them perhaps as soldiers. And I noted that uh, uh, Henry Plaskett, John's son was a soldier in World War I. Um, did John have any, any uh, input into the war effort? No. Uh, in the First World War, let's see now, 35 plus 40, he, he was 39 when First World War broke out, yeah. and uh, um, that was probably considered too old. Well, I was thinking more on the 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 theoretical astronomy end of it, um, oh. for uh, navigation and stuff like that. No, not that I have heard or read. Mm -hmm. But his um, son, of course, 
served in Passchendaele, where, which was a real slaughter field in the First World War, but right. Harry survived and went on to great things yeah. in astronomy. And are, is there any surviving, uh, well, I'm sure there's some, but uh, is there a place for personal correspondence between uh, him and other astronomers, uh, personal letters and whatnot? Is there a source for those anywhere? Well, uh, most, uh, a lot of the letters, uh, that's a bit of a difficult question for me to answer at the moment. Uh, there, there is correspondence in the National Ar Archives in Ottawa, but it's mostly official correspondence. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, he would write to an astronomer for advice or about a report or something of that nature. That's likely found in Ottawa. But uh, for personal letters, uh, you really have to go to the recipient, wherever the recipient's archives might be. Like he corresponded with Annie Plaskett, for instance, and uh, Annie, Annie Cannon, I should say. Yeah. And uh, her correspondence is in the archives at Harvard. And uh, he corresponded with Captine and his archives are in Holland. And, so it involves uh, worldwide research. Um, I can't pretend to have covered, you know, discovered every letter he wrote, but uh, any um, any source that I thought uh, likely, I inquired or checked the online catalog for <clears throat> correspondence with Plaskett. Um, the, I should say the American Institute of Physics uh, and the, uh, their library, the Niels Bohr Library, uh, is a wonderful resource for finding answers to questions like yours uh, because they, they have, um, what's the word, a, a compounded or <laughs> agglomerated the information in their own database. So for instance, if you go to the American Institute of Physics website and look for Plaskett correspondence, you'll see that, oh yes, there is correspondence uh, with Hale and, and it's at, uh, you know, at, um, one of two repositories in California, or um, you'll even find uh, Toronto, University of Toronto archives that relate to physics and astronomy are included in the um, AIP database. Well, I know obviously it's a, the personal letters can be <coughs> sources to get sort of their, their, their opinions on things that, that they wouldn't share otherwise and can bring yeah. them. I would love to have, uh, to, you know, to be able to read some of Plaskett's personal correspondence. I know for a fact that he and Harry exchanged weekly letters when, when Harry was living in England and uh, working at Oxford University. He would write to his father every week. And uh, the letters are said to have been very gossipy. I'm sure quite fascinating, but none have survived that I know of. And I wouldn't, it doesn't surprise me because Harry apparently had a very reticent personality, completely unlike his father, and uh, probably ensured that no family correspondence survived. <coughs> also, so Pete, oh, go ahead, Peter, sorry. Yeah, I, I was just going to say that there's also uh, a story I don't know whether Eric Briggs is with us online or not, but Eric has pointed out that on one occasion, Helen Hogg visited um, Joseph Pierce and, uh, you know, was staying at their place, I think. And while she was there, he burned a whole pile of Plaskett's letters 
put them in the fireplace and but nobody seems to know why he did it or <laughs> why she witnessed this but that's the story so i well, just i'll just comment on your last point there peter uh richard pierce joseph pierce's son uh does have some letters from helen hogg to his father um so he's going to donate them to University of Toronto, I believe, at some point. Uh, just say again, please, Dennis. The oh, letters so are from who to who? From, from Helen Sawyer Hogg to, to Joseph Pierce. Oh, yeah. Yes, I'm sure of that. But what I was speaking about was Plaskett letters. That yeah, Pierce right. Wrote. Yeah. I, yeah. Just, I just thought I'd mention the, the Helen Sawyer Hogg letter, letters oh. that Richard has. So um, in the basement of our observatory, we have thousands of uh, lantern slides. Um, I brought some home to, with the intention of, of scanning them and I did a few, but they're all basically uh, velocity curves and other scientific stuff. Although in the one, I did find another one, it was an image of um, Annie Jump Cannon. So in the next few months, I'm gonna go back and sort go through the other boxes because Plastic gave a couple of talks in Victoria where he reminisced about his visits to observatories in Europe, where he had pictures that he had taken, pictures of astronomers. I'm hoping that perhaps there are some of those lantern slides in the boxes in the basement. That would be quite cool to find. It sure would. I hope you do. <laughs> and I hope I get to see them. <laughs> well, you will. If I find any, you will definitely see them. I also mentioned that Annie Jump Cannon did a sweater for uh, Harry Plaskett when he was over in Europe during the war. Yeah. Yes, she was very you know, devoted. You note know, you know that in your book, I believe. But uh, yeah. she was, she felt very close to the Plaskets. And um, so, for the benefit of everybody else on here, I do want to acknowledge Dennis's. Uh, you know, very strong interest in Plaskett and historical stuff relating to him. And I, he's been wonderful about sharing it with me. Um, I will just share something else with everybody in the chat window. Well, to, I put up a link earlier to all these old photos that we've scanned. There's a website that has those. Um, one of the other things we found was a photo folder containing monthly work reports that first Plaskett and then um, Harper as, a, as assistant director sent back to Ottawa. So they detail, oh, not detail, but there's a pair of sentence or two for each person each month on what they worked on. So that website has, has those. Um, and I've, I've updated the, the information to include newspaper articles and other, inf other things to kind of flesh it out a bit. Um, it's really interesting as you get into the late 20s and early 30s, uh, how intensely he and, and Pierce are working on the galactic rotation work and everything. It's, uh, yeah, it's really cool to see that actually feel, get the feel of it actually happening before your eyes. Yeah. Well, that was something I, I found quite difficult without, I guess, the benefit of those reports. But I uh, often wondered, well, I wonder how much Pierce did and how much Plaskett did and what each of them contributed to this. Um, there's a couple of hints in the, in the formal papers, but not too much. So, Well, uh, I think, I mean, Plaskett was definitely, you know, the... the, the the impetus for getting it done. But I think Pierce did a lot of the calculations and, you know, just a, a lot, maybe some of the grunt work, you know, mm -hmm. you would call it, but, you know, he had to be, he had to do all these complicated calculations properly. And, uh, yeah. you know, Plaskett trusted that to Pierce. Um, yeah, but you find out, I mean, there's all, all sorts of interesting things in there. The, um, you know, the reports cover the period 1921 to 1932, I believe. But during the time from 1918 to 1941, the observatory had two secretaries. Um, the second one was uh, Laura Blake. And uh, anyways, there's a gap in the reports where she's off work for seven or eight months. And then she comes back from a vacation in Southern California. When I looked up her death certificate, it noted that she had a kidney removed in 1932, which was the reason she was off work for so long. 
Mm, wow. Well, now that reminds me of something. As you know, I've been transcribing uh, Otto Klotz's um, diary. I've completed one volume, but um, he does write about uh, Reynold Young and. Oh, he does. And his divorce, uh, Reynold Young's divorce, which of course was quite scandalous in the in the day. Um, I don't want to impugn anybody's reputation, but <laughs> it, it, it shed some new light on this story. I can say that much. So we just had an inquiry at the observatory from um, some somebody that wants to know. I guess they're doing a project on the 1922 solar eclipse. And they wanted to know if anybody from the observatory was involved or whether we had any artifacts. Um, so the, the one in Australia. Yes, the one in Australia, yes. Uh, oh, well. There was quite a bit of coverage of that in Australian newspapers too, and uh, including, you know, inter uh, Chant gave lectures and uh, I found a picture of Young in the Sydney Morning Herald. Uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, well, that's interesting. I I thought it was quite also interesting to notice that uh, uh, in 1922, of course, was the solar eclipse in Australia, but it was also the year of, that Plaskett uh, produced this paper about the very massive binary system. And the, uh, the press hunted Young down in Australia to ask him about Plaskett's discovery. <coughs> yeah, in the work report for April 22, 1922, Plaskett notes, or just, uh, the most important work of the month has been the discovery and announcement of the most massive star known. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, and it was great for publicity. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> he, 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 um, <laughs> I guess you'd say milked it for all it was worth. Oh, he did. Um, there's a, I found a paper in New Jersey. New discoveries made by Canadian astrologists. Oh, astrologists. <laughs> I know. Uh -huh. I seem to recall uh, Chant, anyways, taking a ship from Vancouver to New Zealand to get to Australia for that eclipse. But I, I'm less certain of, of uh, Plaskett's plans. Uh, well, Plaskett didn't observe the eclipse, but Reynold Young, who was his assistant, okay. was co-opted by Chant to go okay. with him to um, uh, to Australia. So Chant traveled out to Victoria, picked up Young, and off they went. Okay. So well, again, I'm hoping that perhaps in our collection of lantern slides, we might have some that Young used in his public lectures about the eclipse. But, uh -huh. Well, I think uh, Chant had took a lot of pictures, and I'm not sure Randall might know if they're in the archives. We the RSC archives does have some of Chant's um, lantern slides, but I don't know whether any date from that. Um, not to my knowledge. <coughs> uh, my knowledge is not certain. Most of Chant's lantern slides that we have are the that set he used for um, commercial educational purposes. So 100 lantern slides, mm -hmm. um, and I don't, I don't even remember the date of those, Peter. Mm -hmm. It'll come to me as soon as I, as soon as this webinar ends, of course. Um, I don't think there are any in there, though there might be. Uh -huh. And I don't know what the Department of Astronomy, if they have any or not. But anyway, just a thought. Uh, Dennis. Yes, Randall. Um, presumably, well, does the observatory still have the original library? Or what would have been the original working library? Uh, no. Um, no, it's, it's, we have a, a, a good part. I mean, we have some of it. Um, and I think we've saved all the old books, uh, although they were ca called but so we have all the important old books. We have all the old, uh, all the collection of observatory publications. Um, 
so but but I we threw out about all the old journals we had because we needed space for an adopt, adaptive optics lab. Um, but then we found we've gone through and found boxes of material and we hired an archivist for a couple of years and she uh, did a great job of cataloging, organizing a lot of that material. And we found interesting things like we have the um, short synchronome company pendulum clock uh, that was at the Dominion Observatory until 1970, I guess. It happens. And it was the Canada's official time from 1930 until 19 <laughs> until 1950 when they moved to a quartz uh, clock. Um, but we have the original bill of sale for that, which is really cool. Uh, Good heavens! Yeah, those were they, they were insanely expensive. Yeah, mm. and there was a, like we had a book listing all the people that own these clocks. And there was three owned by, I forget his name now, but this fellow in Tuxedo Park, New Good York. Hell. And I, so I figured, who the hell is this guy? Um, let me just see if I can find it here. This guy ran a research park, 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 and uh, uh, I forget his name, but he always had real real important people coming and visiting him and uh yeah so uh anyways it's uh, it's fascinating what you can find when you uh you go down and uh yeah. i think elizabeth griffin's son found one of those i forget where oxford I, I, oxford perhaps it was being trashed oh Did god it? uh he saved it and he restored the damn thing I mean, she's got the full story, but uh, yeah, that, that's really cool that you guys still have that. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we've got that. Loomis was this guy's name. Um, and L O O M I S. Uh, yes. Oh, of course there and, was. Yeah, uh, it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be the it wouldn't be the Yale Loomis, of course, because oh, that's well, are... much later than that. But yeah, might be a relative. That's <laughs> yeah, interesting. This guy he Elias. did he invented Loran. Mm. Alfred Lor Alfred Loomis. Um, well, I know you're interested in genealogy, so you could see if Elias from Yale, Elias Loomis was an ancestor of this guy. <laughs> so you know the um, the representative from the U.S. Virgin Island in uh, in the House of Representatives is a is a Plaskett. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. Like I say, she's 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 not the same color as uh, John Stanley, but uh, she has the Plaskett name. So oh well, and is she a Democrat or a Republican? Oh, Democrat, I'm pretty sure. Oh, good. <laughs> but uh, the problem with getting back to your original question, Peter, mm -hmm. the big problem is that societies, well. There's going to be problems with what I'm going to say, but we'll forget that for a moment. So what society looks for at a particular period in an icon changes, of course. It's in constant flux. And if we were talking about a Canadian icon for 1950s, it would be certainly different from what we'd be looking for now. Yes, that's quite true. And so if one were to re-inject Plaskett to try to, well, try to inject him into a, uh, you know, elevate him as, as an icon. Now it might be more difficult than it would have been back then. I agree with you, of course. Uh, I hope this won't be taken the wrong way, but I, I'm sure if he were not a white male from the 1920 era, things could be different. I mean, societies have got to change, of course. Um, yeah. I, mean, I mean, you want that. And yeah, we don't most want stuff any, for, Most of the stuff is for the better, of course. People don't um, want any old white guys anymore as icons, I guess. Interesting question. <laughs> interesting question, or one of the interesting questions. So I, I like what Dennis found, that there are those wartime, you know, biographies of, of great Canadians, you know, in order to give, you know, Canadians on the front or whatever, or at home, uh, more of a sense of identity, a cohesion. Um, I'd be interested to know 
when Plaskett sort of fell from the radar of, mm -hmm. you know, the great and the good in Canada? Well, yeah, that, I think as far as the public is concerned, I mean, you've got to remove Victoria from this discussion because they, they still remember and um, honor Plaskett's memory, but uh, otherwise the general public, I think dis he disappeared from the radar as soon as he was dead. Because he could no longer tend, he was no longer there to tend the garden of his own image. Yeah, yeah that's exactly the point. Yes. Let this be a lesson for all of us. I'm just. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose yes. if you could have, if you could have your name stuck on, say, the invention of a, of a law in physics, or um, a new object, and obviously discovering a comet ain't good enough. But no, you've got to be a someone like Martin Schmidt, for instance, um, or 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 you know, Jocelyn Bell Bernal. Um, I don't know, I mean, what assures uh, you know, one's longe longevity? So, so Peter, I mean, um, you, what would you see as a, a representation of Plaskett as an icon? I mean, I, is it just a sense, a sense of uh, an awareness of, in the broad Canadian yeah. community? Yeah, I think historians, whatever, they're, <laughs> There seem to be fewer and fewer historians now, but um, they, uh, well, I, I have uh, managed to raise the issue in a couple of places with people who are, uh, you know, professional historians and they're, they're receptive and interested, but uh, to my way of thinking, science and technology is one of the most vital parts of our society. And uh, people should at least know as much about important scientists like Plaskett as they do about Lucy Maud Montgomery. I have nothing against Lucy, but she wrote books of fiction and Plaskett <laughs> expanded our knowledge of the universe uh, to my way of thinking they're at least comparable and everybody if some if the person in the street said i never heard of lucy maud montgomery uh people are almost uh, what's the word i want uh, disdainful of them her uncouth you know, <laughs> what kind of an ignoramus are you you've never heard of her but if somebody says i never heard of john stanley plaskett then Oh well, that's not surprising. <laughs> it might be worse than that. If you if you were to ask the average person on the street, uh, immediately, so you're doing a vox pop, and you've got the microphone there in front of them. Name yeah. a Canadian, name a famous Canadian scientist. Uh huh. I think it's more 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 likely you would get hesitations, ums, and uh, a what? Yeah. Then if you ask name a, uh, a famous Canadian pop musician who's known around the world, famous Canadian author of serious fiction. You'd even have more success there. Yeah. And the scientists. I think it's just yeah. those it's things. The, the old story that the, the humanities and the sciences are divorced from each other. Uh, yeah. It's a oh, CP it's thing. It's a bit 20, false. Tw though. 20 years from now will be the centennial of uh, Plaskett's death. So maybe that. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Wow. Now, Plaskett's biggest drawback is that he's not a hockey player, <laughs> yeah. nor, nor a rock star, although Joe Plaskett might be related to John Stanley Plaskett. Yeah, Joel Plaskett, yeah. So oh, just a little anecdote, uh, our, the archivist we had waiting, working for us, uh, she came from Winnipeg. Um, her, her, she originally lived, was born in India. Um, but anyway, she's great. She did great work. But I tried to bring her up to a little Canadian education. So one day I asked her, do you know who, can, who Gordon Lightfoot is? And she goes, is he a hockey player? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So she's, you know, she's 32 now. So I mean, it's, it's a challenge. Knows, but she knows who Plaskett is. That's a nice switch. Yeah, well, she's interested in astronomy, which is why she was so so enthusiastic to get this job for us and everything. Yeah. So, um, now, this, this just highlights the, the general problem in Canada that people of high intellectual achievement 
really don't get much notice at all. They will on the CBC, but who listens to the CBC all that much? Uh-huh. You know, it's a, it, it's, it's a cultural thing, totally different than in places in Europe uh, where statues are erected to famous scientists and poets, yeah. Yeah. this sort of thing. But uh, we're, we're too young a country, apparently, to, uh, to go that far. Although Margaret Atwood is slowly inching her way that way, I feel. Yeah, right. Yeah, she is. I mean, I think uh, Margaret Atwood is, uh, yeah, she's definitely getting towards that status. Thing. And my feeling about current science is that it's very unlikely to honor, difficult to honor individual scientists because they, you know, they're always collaborating with others and uh, there's the thought of an individual making uh, the contribution is perhaps um, difficult. I mean, you can talk about Nobel Prize winners like Dr. Peebles, but uh, other than that, um, it's, uh, it's hard. I don't think there will be Canadian icons of current or even international icons of science other than Nobel laureates because they it gets too complicated. But it's a it's a challenge if people don't even remember who Banting was. I mean, uh, yeah. that's yeah. it's a real challenge, isn't it? Yeah, there's a certain amount of luck at play, of course. Um, if someone might... has a particular appearance. Yes, perhaps conforms. If there's a particular appearance, if they're lucky in who writes them up in particularly prominent, um, particularly prominent uh, media outlets, and if they get support, um, you, I guess they have to have all those things, you know, going in their favor. Mm-hmm. Another person worth uh, comparing, I guess, is um, uh, Plas- J.S. Plaskett's nephew who was an artist, oh, I, and I think of his first Joseph, name. Joseph. Yeah, Joseph. Joseph Plaskett, um, uh, quite a renowned artist. He started in Canada, but spent the later years of his life in Paris, and then ultimately in England. And I think, I'm sure, in fact, that Joseph Plaskett is better known among Canadians, not that much better, but better known than John Stanley, simply because he's an artist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, looking at the time, and we're getting close to two hours. Yes, um, everybody's been very patient. Yeah, um, and I did want to, I, uh, I just did a, this afternoon for fun, I, I did a Google search for 19th century Canadian scientists. Mm-hmm. And lo and behold, the page comes up with, there's, there's 11 names on the thing. Uh-huh. Um, and so clearly there's even, if you wanted to try and, and learn about this, uh, your first hits aren't going to get you very far. And class gets nowhere to be seen. No. Well... Uh, he didn't. He certainly wasn't famous until the twentieth century. So well, even even then, I can go to the twentieth century, and his name's not there either. So um, uh-huh. it does sort of highlight why the work you've been doing is so important. There are very few Canadian historians, and especially when it comes to the sciences and, and particularly astronomy. So uh, I think your contribution has been excellent in that, and, and very important. Well, thank you, Clark. Uh, and maybe that's one of the reasons, one of the things we're trying to do in the history committee is is bring more awareness to our history. I say ours in RASP, but obviously it needs to go beyond that. So, yeah. So I guess the last thing to do would be to send it to Phil, and and I do want to thank uh, Phil, Randall, Chris. And I should thank Jenna as well, Jenna Hines, who helped organize this. And of course, Peter for, for coming out and, and sh- spending the time with us. So thanks very much, uh, Phil.
Yeah, I, I just want to extend my thanks to all of you as well. Um, a fascinating talk, and uh, I agree we should all probably know more about uh, about Plaska, but we should know more about our, our scientific heritage in general. And that's why I'm uh, I'm proud of our history committee and of the the fact that uh, that this society at least takes its history very seriously, um, and uh, and hopefully we'll continue to do so. And thank you to all of the people who hung in there for the full two hours. Um, some I know probably couldn't, but uh, but they, they came anyway for a Thursday night talk uh, about an historical figure. And uh, so I want to thank everyone who was in attendance here tonight as well. This is uh, the first of the special speaker series for this year, the first of the history uh, committee speakers for this year, but not the last. Rest assured, there will be many more uh, such sessions. Uh, and of course, we do have a wonderful virtual GA that we're uh, just in the process of planning coming up in June, where there will be speakers and uh, and some of which will be on historical topics. So um, we look forward to seeing you at that event as well. So thank you once again, everyone, and uh, have a, a good night and uh, clear skies as, as much as you can in the next little while. <laughs>